Okay. So we have three rooms together. It's a long time. If you need to go whatever you need to go, restrooms are uh, here, coffee over there. They for a break at the end of the hours. So we're going to talk about this soon. Uh, I'm going to try to be as vivid um, and coming to life for you as possible. We have different audiences today. We have people who are Java developers. We have people who are more product centric. We have people who want to operate with Zoom. There are very different uh, concerns. We're going to try to make everybody happy, which is possible. So with that uh, out of the way, um, we'll, we'll go first into the introduction of what this is. And at a high level, it does for people who have no introduction to blockchain whatsoever, so they can understand what uh, this, this whole thing is doing. Um, we'll talk about how to operate that software. We'll talk about how uh, we can configure it. We'll talk about some of the switches that some of you already have had to manipulate to get things to production. Um, and then we'll go into code. So we'll go into code, we'll go into the structure of the code. To how to extend the code, um, and I'll show you a couple of ways where code can be meaningfully uh, changed to allow for new possibilities. Um, and hopefully, out of this whole session, we have a little bit of a jump start that can help us with uh, the session this afternoon where we talk about what we want to do next and also about that back then so we can. Sound good? All of those uh, materials that I'm going to talk about today are actually available on the wiki of Hackulator. I gave the first version of this workshop back in July. Um, back then, we did it in four hours, so we're about to try to do something a little faster, which may work well because we're in person. Uh, I might pass on things, you know, I might look deeper into others, depending on what you ask me. Um, and this is a little bit of the agenda. So, first, I did some basic. Then 30 minutes, 60 minutes on running the business network. Um, then, you know, the developer side of things, 20 minutes on basic GitHub. Then, since setting up the ID, we can show you how to run things, rattle, stuff like that. Um, <laughs> content on the registry, and then go into uh, doing some, some prerequisites. Um, we'll pass on that because I'll take time to go over that with you today. But just if I, if you were to do this at home, uh, if you're sitting in front of your laptop right now, uh, you can. Get all those things going, Java, Git, Docker, Compose, your favorite ID, um, as much as possible, download the basic sources. And uh, the consensus folks have done a great job with a uh, problem the quick start if you're trying to create a simple uh, development environment at home or you want to create a little consortium in the laptop. Okay, so thanks. Okay. So uh, my name is Antoine, I work at Splunk. Uh, I'm a Actually, the manager. So, really, you shouldn't take any advice from me from a development standpoint. Um, before working at Splunk, I worked at Consensus in the past life, where I helped with Pantheon, but I also helped with Orion, Quorum, a few other things. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been uh, in open source since 20, leading myself to 2006. Uh, first Eclipse. I'm an Apache Software Foundation member. Um, I am now involved in the Open Telemetry Project, where I am the one of the approvers for the uh, collector uh, project for collector control. Oh, and I should mention, Splunk is uh, in my employer. Uh, thanks to Splunk, I'm here today. Also, thanks to the Hyperledger Foundation for sponsoring this trip for me, so I was able to come here in person. Uh, Splunk is um, a monitoring solution that applies itself to the enterprise. Um, if you have data that is coming from your machines and you'd like to make sense of it, that's how you end up using Splunk. If you have any questions about Splunk, talk to me in that. Okay, Ethereum, I think everybody here may have had a heard of that term, right? So largest crypto by market cap. Uh, starting in 2014, a different clients. That's very different from actually Bitcoin. Bitcoin has just one client. And uh, instead of a single application, it's a programmable layer where you can execute smart contracts with CPM. That was a major innovation back then on the telecom 
from this, uh, you know, the enterprise us uh, here in this room, people here, uh, as an existing businesses, wanted to do well supported client with uh, different approach employments, not just mainnet, but you know, different uh, census, uh, everything permission by default, and security from the point of view audits, data management, data sharing, privacy, all the things. So, um, the enterprise firm alliance, for example, was one of those uh, elements. And you can see some of the actors there, some of them in the room here, right, uh, who participated in these efforts. Um, so, definitely a, a big uh, influx of folks interested in, in doing work on top of Ethereum, but with a slight different set of goals. So, first thing was form. Haven't heard of it. It's a fork of Geth, which is a very popular uh, good uh, client for for Ethereum. Um, built by uh, JP Morgan Chase, uh, eventually owned by Consensus through different business deals decisions. Um, and um, we talked about that yesterday. It's uh, you know, with a private enclave, you can host the data for private transactions, which allows a shared nothing architecture. So you can actually have folks not share data unwillingly to everybody else. Okay. Um, it's kind of cool as well that it had new algorithms. Um, I kind of like craft because it's uh, simple. It's just a it's a job. No longer blockchain, you know, per se, but it's fine. And NDFT, QDFT, all those different flavors of consensus, which allows a set of validators to validate what's going on. Um, and then uh, out of uh, Nathan became uh, in 2019 as a contribution from consensus. Things like that, we'll, uh, we'll just keep going. Okay, so we're still in the uh, introduction of the entries at the stage. Okay, we'll go now to Hyperledger itself. Hyperledger, I think there was a mention yesterday of the, the greenhouse, right? This is a view of what Hyperledger is trying to be. It's not just about projects, not just about particular stance, but uh, fostering an ecosystem of projects around uh, blockchain in general. So uh, you may have your favorite project listed here. If not, it might actually be because the site is kind of old since a month ago, uh, but there are uh, quite a few projects active on Hyperledger itself. So this would place a part in that as part of the ecosystem of Hyperledger, which is why it makes sense to have all this data together. Uh, at a high level, uh, we're going to now talk about what an Ethereum client is, and I think this is going to be a uh, useful set of terms and definitions of people who think about this at a product level. Uh, you know, if not, well, we can help clarify. Um, so first off, when we talk about an Ethereum client, it's a complete misnomer, uh, because it's actually a peer-to-peer -peer agent in the server in the first place, right? This is serving data for HTTP. Um, it, one thing that is true to every firm client so far, except maybe um, it's starting to get better, is it runs a single process on your machine. The idea at first when they started Ethereum was it should run on your laptop. It should run your laptop, which is great. Um, it's independent, meaning that uh, because it's on the blockchain, it does not trust anyone. They can perform all exchanges, submit transactions, you can interrupt the chain all from one. Piece of software. Right. These are the functional requirements of the Ethereum client. This is some of the foundation of why the client is built the way it is. So, um, Hyperledger basically is a complex software stack, and this is just a diagram of all the ports that it opens. Some of those ports you'll never have to use them, thankfully, uh, but these are apples and network interfaces you can have. The, um, most famous one, of course, is uh, the FPS here, where going to other regions, so 3303. Um, if you were to connect to your BSU node to get RPC in and out, you can connect over HTTP at 8545, over socket 8546. And uh, as known, um, you can also use BSU to mine by connecting over a persistent TCP connection over the Triton protocols over port 8008. And uh, this has an ethat module you can connect out to an ethat server of the web sockets. So you can send data 
um, to an ESAT server uh, if you're single. And if that server itself is just a, a web front end that you can see, where you can see what's happening uh, using consulting. Um, so another thing to note is that this is the database. So going down a little bit the stack in terms of complexity, um, we mentioned yesterday that it's using RocksDB storage. Um, it has multiple store of RocksDB, not just one, but multiple. And here's one. Right, so uh, we have all the blocks that have to be stored on this. All the collections have to be stored on this as well. Um, these are the collections. This is a tree of them to be uh, cryptographically confined to making sure we have a root node that can set aside the blocks. Um, and then we also have all the account states that are going to be stored on this. So all this information has to be stored somewhere. These are different files, different stores. Um, so this by itself is complex. It's actually multiple databases, multiple tables in the database. And basically with the transaction tool, so it's also able to sort uh, through um, a sorted set of transactions according to its best principles using any gas price counts, all the sorts of acres we can think of to create a sequence out of out of sequence incoming uh, requests from different parts. So, um, Bezu is also a network agent. I mentioned it's a peer to peer agent, right? It's completely independent and it requires its own configuration. When it first connects, it has no idea who it's going to talk to. So, its initial configuration has to be exact. So, it can actually enforce validation of any connection coming in. The first thing it's going to ask you for is a Genesis block and a set of consensus engine parameters so that it knows. And connect to others that is able to uh, judge the blocks which are being shared. Right? And the last thing is it needs boot nodes, right? So when you connect over the network, you're going to need to be able to um, find all peers. There's a couple ways to do that. If you're in the enterprise, maybe you just want to have static peering uh, where you know exactly who to connect to, you have a list of them. But if you're going to go with mainnet, then you're going to go to a server. Ask it for this peers you can connect to, you keep asking until you have enough of those, then you can keep going. Okay. So, to go deeper on that, so this discovery mechanism is you connect over UDP. First, you connect to put nodes, then you connect all the peers that it's passing on, so you can start having a bit of a network effect. Um, you're using a, a Kedamia hash table to connect all of those. I'm not sure that's that relevant for you because you're enterprise to introduce discovery in that way. No, right? No. Okay, you do. Interesting. Oh, sorry. I was, that was a, I, I heard you and understood, but haven't done it. Okay. So, just for your enjoyment, uh, you should sure what you use mainnet. This is the way that it used to be, right? You would connect blindly and just ping back and forth nodes until finally someone could answer. And eventually you get a collection of those, you can keep them really close to you. It uses a hash table to get them there to have different buckets of those based on the keys of those nodes so that you will be able to share them with some of your kit, but not all of them at once. So you have like a, the notion of islands where different parts of the network don't talk to each other. Um, but that's now kind of old. Um, there's a new discovery mechanism using DNS, using uh, TXT records over DNS. That uh, is kind of scraped from the foundation servers every two hours. You can actually see it on the internet going to GitHub. They have a project where it goes to a huge table of all the nodes that they're able to get to. Uh, and then they're being indexed. And uh, using this TXT approach, you can uh, cryptographically securely get all this information, make sure it's valid. And then connect all of them. But the truth is, most of the time, because you're in the enterprise, you're going to go with static peering. Static peering is um, the safest possible approach to things because you know exactly who you're going to talk to. And the URL of the other peers is going to look like it's or going the only way around. So here, uh, this is what we call the e node URI, URL, URI. Um, where first the 
first factors, if I remember correctly, are um, the exit small plantation of your public key and compressed. So that's a public, you know, that's your identity. The node, this key is stored as part of the identity. The node on the first note, it creates an identity and then it refers to it, it becomes its reputation, it becomes its ability to express itself on the network, right? You can also define those keys before you start the network, which is kind of important in consulting because you want to make sure you have that defined ahead of time. It's followed by a little path, as you can see, and then you have a host, a port, and you can define there's a disk port, a discovery port, a DB port. It's going to be on uh, by default. 30303, you could be on it. So scale that's the data is from. If you think about it, right? The main network store started from the CDP messages, and eventually you found all the static peering because we're testing, we're doing a bunch of things. They made those URIs available. The enterprise folks said, well, actually, this is this is what we want. We don't want all that stuff. It's way too much. Let's just do the thing at the bottom here, right? But you were a little second class citizen compared to what the original intent was, right? So you're in for clients, welcome, you just join the pond, the network, you kind of have a, a new thing on who to connect to. You're going to now uh, find a peer, find a peer, you're going to say hello, right? You say hello, and when you say hello to another node, you say, I happen to be on um, chain ID 1237. Um, I will talk the following uh, types of subprotocols, if I can talk whisper, I can talk uh, IDFT as some set of messages, um, you may also create your own, which is a lot of fun, right? And the other notes need to reply and say, great, uh, I'll need right? And um, I just discovered we don't have the same chain ID, so I'm going to mark this right here. Right? So you've done all this work there, find them, when you connect to them, they tell you, actually, they, we're not on the same chain. So that's a, that's a known, uh, Behavior for the implementation. And so, if you've seen a little bit of the elements of software, if you look at this from the point of the life cycle, when you first start your basic mind, the first thing you need to do is look at each instance block, find if it's got any data and store locally, um, get new blocks and peers using the connections you have, you have. eventually reach what they think is the head of clinical change. You never, you never know for sure which you have the head. But from everybody you talk to, nobody has a better product than you do. Therefore, you must be at the top, right? You must have reached the head of the chain. In that case, it's safe to start trying to make new blocks, which is the thing that Facebook will do. It will try to keep uh, an idea of whether it's at the head or not. In that case, it will allow itself to, to, block, to make new blocks. Um, then it will participate in propagating those blocks because then it's necessary to make sure that the collection gets through. So it's really just self, self survival on anything else. Um, and then you find out that it's behind, it needs to get uh, sync its data again, get new blocks, and goes like this. So your client at any point in time may go back and say, Oh, I had a network leak, I'm five blocks behind. It's not everything. Do not let me get collections, put them in the pool, wait a little bit, and then I have to start getting blocks. But it's not to say stop, 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 stop. So usually what it does, it will continue taking collections and transaction pool will continue to, to flow. And um, it will also have a mechanism on the side, which I will mention uh, in this diagram, is that you will also gossip all transactions being sent to you to other clients to maximize the opportunity for other clients to send the transaction to the client. So you might be behind, but you have a local client telling you, hey, I have a collection coming in. In that case, you may go send them to other, and maybe one of the nodes which is able to, to mint will be able to mint. So for example, if you're in a IDFT network, you have maybe five nodes that can actually create blocks, right? But you may have 200 nodes total on your network, and most of them are not being able to mint, but through gossip, eventually the nodes that can mint will have the collections being related to them, and not put them into blocks based on their own collection. So you're also doing the work where every time you see a new block, 
looking to see if any of the collections you had in your pool were things at your blog, because then you can drop them from your collection. Okay, so that's required. As soon as running 24 7 at all times, trying to catch up, when you go up, trying to set data, that's all it does. So um, now we have one client. Let's see, you know, if you had, here we have one, two, three, about eight of them, right? Um, they're going to be part of consensus, and they're going to have choices. So you can choose all sorts of different approaches to having a, a way to decide how blocks are being created based on the best aptitude and suit your team. So, for example, by default, if you were to use it, you would be using proof of work. Which is that everybody's competing with everybody. It's not even doing a math on the side, trying to find the equation that's going to allow you to create a block with a lower difficulty than a certain threshold, which is based on uh, what you'd like to see from the network. That's the default mechanism for uh, public mainnet. Are you familiar with that? Yes. For the mainnet, are we not on the proof of stake yet? Um, I will talk about that. If you'd like to talk about that, we'll talk about that. That's another consensus version that is available to base to for consumptions. I don't think we've seen that yet. Anyone here that is to staking network? We can talk about that, but I don't think it's being used in the enterprise right now. Um, that's a good question. So there are others, right? Uh, the GIF. Uh, developers, when they started doing development on GIF, they had a need to do a little toy uh, consensus mechanism that would allow them to also do tests. Proof of work is expensive. You're spending CPU time trying to complete math all the time to get the next block, which is not ideal if you're just trying to do a test net where you don't have that much money to do that. So they created something called Click, which is proof of a free. What you do is you click inside your Genesis block who's going to be allowed to be in the box, right? And then you're going to allow transitions later during the life cycle of the blockchain to say, hey, I have a new signer. So the, the, the new authority is going to be allowed to mint blocks going forward. So you can pass on the baton that you know, for example. Now, uh, if you remember, so know the idea of string and is in the derive. That identity is what is going to define who is able to mint, which is a big deal. A BFT, different mechanism. Now you have a number of nodes that can validate the take terms, and some of them are going to be proposing blocks, some of them are going to be approving the blocks. Okay. And that's a subset of the total. And then, yeah, so proof of stake is when we delegate altogether all the actual consensus layer, so the decisions of whether to include a block or not, into a different set of machines. Which run based on staking, which is based on how much uh, money uh, is at stake to guarantee a block is valid. So, the point for a consortium is that if you do staking, then it needs to make sense, which probably requires a few lawyers in the room to make sure that the state has an actual real incentive in the real world. Okay. There's one more thing that this uh, does it's an actual server, it's a JSON RPC server. You've used it, you can use Truffle, or any of the tools you know, that allow you to interface with clients. Most of the communication is done over the port 8545, I showed earlier, and most of the uh, interaction there is going to be uh, around calling or sending collections. Calling meaning getting data out of the chain or sending collections, which is submitting collections. I think that not alone is that there are multiple ways to do that. You can do it over HTTP. When you do it, you can actually batch the request, which is very useful in terms of performance. Um, you can use it uh, with MetaMask, with the wallets, that's what's done. You can also use WebSocket, which is great for a different set of use cases around uh, subscriptions. So you can ask to get notified in real time whenever the client sees a particular set of transactions coming in, right? So it's be able to react to that. Um, Extremely expensive too, in terms of CPU. Don't do that if you're doing this on the other one. Don't pop on your website to be sorry. 
um, IPC, which is just a file socket on your uh, server. Uh, that's great if you want to secure by default. Yes, you need to go and default to that. It will allow you to still connect to your to your server and do all sorts of JSON RPC, but you're no longer exposing a HTTP port on your server, which is probably ideal from a security standpoint. Uh, that was just many to be to control frequency. So that was a contribution from. Uh, Diego, remember correctly. And uh, one thing that's not well known is that uh, Bisu has the GraphQL interface, which is also supported by Git. Bisu did a lot of work to get that GraphQL uh, API to be in good state. Uh, it's quite stable now. What it allows you to do is to go deeper in what you ask. So, what I've seen GraphQL used for is mean by people who want to scout the competition or go deeper into how to go for storage slots, for example, or understand the innards of what is being stored on this, because you can make very precise queries in this approach. Um, so it's useful for mainnet, for traders, for people who have you know, quarter seconds to reply to things. To, so asking uh, over HTTP, using an if call, small contract, where things are at, what's the value of your storage slot, how to do something through CDM. Bypass all this, go to GraphQL, ask the uh, what's in storage, slot 000x, 0x001 of this contract, and get the value out in such bytes, based, uh, dated, so you can actually go past it. That made no sense. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I want to know if you can understand, right? Too. Does the GraphQL API uh, do streaming as well? Does it allow streaming? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think it's HTTP on me, but I might be wrong. I think it's on your sheet. So, in recap, now we have this is the client being a database, a peer to peer agent, an API server, and a queue. Those things does way too much. If you were the only one doing IT in any company, you'd be screaming at me right now. Because we have four different servers with different level of database, APIs, reliability settings. Like if you've done any ops work, your queue will have a very different set of resilience parameters than the database, for example. Right? So it's good to know that when you do this, you're going to have to put together, and when you operate this in pod, you're going to have to put together all requirements from four different different systems and think about them as one. So now you have a lot more constraints in how you run this uh, good system. So one more thing. The, the question that I get this point is you did mention the EDM. Is that uh, is that not a big deal? And the thing is the EDM is everywhere. It's involved at every step of the way of uh, validating the blocks. Updating the work state when you do a collection, but also when you just call and want to get some information at the smart contract, we will execute the EVM. So the EVM is in every one of those components, we suit all the domains. And the EVM here stands for Ethereum uh, Test Machine. Any questions so far? Okay, so this is kind of a newbie question, but even for like native um, transfers, value transfers, EVM is executed. No, it's not. If you're just talking about sending E from A to B, or not, you run the EVM. You, uh, what, what do you mean? In other words, like what do you mean? It's in every one of them. Okay, so I'll show you. So let's see the block. Let's go to you want to make sure the bot is valid. The first thing you need to do is you need to execute the bot and see if the bot execution final state matches what is in the bot information itself. If it does not match, that means that whatever information you have in terms of strategy so far, when you're at block X and X plus one says that it's going to go make those changes and the final set of changes does not match, then you have a mismatch. 
that but isn't valid in each reject. Okay. Um, when you update your bond state, so the block is valid. You want to update your bond state, you want to change your, your information on this, you're going to have to run all those functions and then store the result of the execution of those functions inside the databases. So, This is a really nice diagram by Lucas Salvenha. He's a commuter on this as well, and the consensus employee. Um, so, for example, when you get a block, the block itself is going to have a header. The header is going to have a number of information which is cryptographically important because it shows the state of the blockchain at the time of the block being generated. So, for example, they show the state, um, the state itself as a database. Which represents the world state, which represents all the storage, all the accounts, and all the uh, storage entries. So let's say I have my own personal money, right? I'm going to have my balance here. I'm going to have my current balance, which is the number of times I executed on my account. And I'm going to have a number of entries, which I cryptographically verify with a 32 byte hash, it's my storage rules on my account. That is then rolled up inside the world state try, which is itself also rolled up into a solid to byte hash using uh, a Marco Patricia root tree, so that I can actually verify that everything here is valid at the end of execution. So if I have any difference between the moment I when I execute that uh, block and all its transactions, which are going to be like here, right, in that body. I'm going to be able to say for sure that if the statement does not match the result of the execution, this bug is invalid. This is how we cryptographically verify that everything makes sense. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, that's how it goes for so when you execute all those transactions, then you're going to have all the receipts of the execution of those transactions. You also calculate all that. Down to study to byte hash again so that you can make sure that the execution of that block, even though you got the right state at the end, that the receipts also match so that they were not being fooled somehow by causing collections are being So that's where the EVM comes. Yes? Yeah, so I guess as a follow up to make sure I understand, if in the block one of the transactions is a native token uh, transfer without yeah, you don't want to play the EVM because you're just doing a, a balance change and then you have a nonce update because you're changing the nonce of the sender. Uh, you will also have a gas cost of 21,000 gas by default whenever you execute the interactions. So you're yeah, you're doing a number of things anyway uh, that will change the world state. So you still end up having to cryptographically verify everything. But the EVM is not playing a role in that sense. So it's all cheaper. The truth is, most of the time, you don't send if because you, you, you're going to have a much better mileage of concatenating and having a number of cascading changes through all the contracts you call um, for execution. Yes. Yeah. Just rather than a question, I comment another useful thing, at least on the enterprise world, that you have, you have band nodes and you have a loud list that you can manage, which then the enterprise set, so that kind of thing is useful because sometimes you can get invalid blocks. And if you recurrently identify them from a specific node, you can ban that node from the table here that you're seeing. The enterprise set of the policy is useful. Yeah. That's true. So you, you, you mean? To repeat what you said for people out there, um, in an enterprise setting, you may uh, allow this specific set of nodes to allow them to send blocks or transactions, and that will limit the uh, ability for anyone to come in and do something foolish by sending something illegal to a network. Um, and you, you can do more, you can do permission at the smart contract level as well. Um, which is something that Bezu supports. It's quite advanced. It's possible for you to limit 
what some accounts can do, such as creating uh, additional contracts. So that's probably the last question on the product. I'm going to go to configuring, which is, you know, really the most interesting part. I talked about code, but if you don't run this thing, I'm going to go. So, um, I believe this have got a lot of thoughts into how to run the best possible way. Uh, there was actually, for the longest time, someone on the team whose job was to just make sure that we had the right options and the right consumer user against the API. So people can figure things without you know, breaking leg or uh, being in a, in a bad state. Um, and so the way it works is that it has the ability to set up common line arguments. Those same common line arguments, what we modified, can be also set as environment variables, or it can use a configuration file. And it's in that order, meaning that you can have a config file and then you can decide to override it with an environment variable. And you can override the environment variable with a command uh, with a CLI. To make it uh, easier on the eye, they are trying to, as much as possible, make sure that those the keys in the config file are going to match the command line arguments, are going to match the environment variables. with some transformations that I outline here. So the environment variable by default is going to be public case. Um, you replace underscore with dashes, and there's a this prefix. Sorry. Underscore replaces dashes. So, for example, uh, dash dash minor dash combase can become b two underscore minor underscore combase. That's important because once you know that, you know, configuration becomes less arcane to work around, and you can take a config file and you will know how to operate it in some to cloud or when you want to play around. So, we have great docs. The docs themselves are open source. You can make Better, but um, you know, the, the doc team basically don't understand what's top notch. Um, it's all being published in markdown format uh, on basic.hypnation.org. I recommend you take a look if you haven't. It's always useful. So, a few first options. Um, if you're doing Bezu, you can choose a number of preset networks that allow you to you know, bypass all the Things you need to talk about and extend things, right? So save yourself some, some hassle. If you're just running this for the first time ever, the first thing you need to do is to say uh, dash dash network equals that. I'm going to explain exactly what that means. And uh, if you wanted to participate in mainnet, but you don't want to be on, on the actual mainnet yet, you want to be on the test end, you could say dash dash network equals trust network. Uh, simple, yeah. Simple, yeah. Trust now. Something like that, right? Um, then uh, another very important uh, element is where you want to store your data. So data dash path, and then you place a folder there. Right? A folder is going to contain multiple files. Why? Because you have multiple databases. Um, then um, you need to expose your basic clients over a to peer network. Therefore, you need to tell it where to find its um, its host. This is going to be local host. If you want Docker, you want to be on 0.0.0.0. .0 .0 .0. It's one of the most uh, common issues in Docker. Local hosts inside the Docker container. You will not be able to break out of your shell if you do that. You need to go to, to that to, uh, to 0, 0, 0, 0 to find out and your port, which by default is 3033. Um, and then you can decide how you want to do discovery. You can set it enabled. You can set some good nodes as well. Oh, okay, so next thing people have trouble with. You run this thing, you try to connect to it to report 8545, it's not there. It's not enabled by default. We don't trust you, okay? That's pretty much what's going on, right? Or the blockchain, by default, GenRPC is not enabled. Not only that, um, if you enable it with, you know, dash dash, obviously dash, dash, dash enabled, um, it will only work on using a local host host by default. Yes. Question from the chat. We just need to give Edo when using Dev Network, right? 
you don't even need to do it. You know, you can just do uh, dash dash make parts equals dev. We'll generate schemas for you on the first boot. And then the network dev, I'll show you, is actually cheating by creating a proof of work network with a fixed difficulty. I'm completely ahead of myself. You don't need to do anything. It's good before. It works the first time. That's the only thing I want to use. It has to work. Right? Um, so when you enable RPC, if you don't do anything, it will be enabled. If you enable it, you still need to tell you exactly what to enable. By default, you will need to connect a set of APIs you want to allow access to. Because some of those are actually pretty dangerous. Okay? So if you're an operations person, this is the moment. Please take action. Write this down. Do not allow admin by default because it allows you to delete bots. Someone gets a hold of your node and is able to send a message. It can say over this admin API, delete all the bots so far. We said, about zero. You are. Okay? So, admin, our user, super user setup. Then you have things which are more related to different consensus or different types of things that you might want to use. So, for example, remember click I mentioned earlier? You have the click method you can call in here that says, now change the leader of my network. Right? Um, debug. Super useful when you're deep inside deployment smart contracts. It allows you to do tracing of the institution. But if it's not on, because it's actually expensive. EDA, EDA is for all the very advanced smart contract capabilities to set permissions, which is too, too advanced to me. We'll talk about that one if you have time. Um, if these all the things that you want to have by default uh, get blocked by number, get the chain head, um, Give me the range of those blocks, give me information about those. Um, and EFT is for anything related to setting the EFT network, the proposers, uh, who you trust to produce blocks from. So if you're joining a consortium, when your validator just bails out one day, stops responding, and all their, I don't know, they work for SVD or something, you know, the bank's gone. Okay, you need a new validator. How are you going to do that? Your network is port, right? So you connect to every one of your nodes, and you tell them, here's a new APFT validator. Replace former with new one. Here is the identity of this validator. Now you're trusted with your life. So don't enable that over the internet. You will have disastrous consequences, of course. Um, miner, so anything related to mining, such as setting your, you uh, can set all sorts of things related to, to proof of work, which I think is interesting for you all. Um, and then we have more things around like plugins and future trouble um, specific to Visio. QDFT is going to be a mirror of what you can do with IDFT in terms of setups. And by default, important to know if that that's at all, right? So by default, those three are available and they allow you to uh, send collections or call to the blockchain to get information, ask stats about who you're connected to. And um, I'll try to let you this. Any questions about those? These are not, I'm taking the time to go through this, but actually, these are not at all from this one. These are just an RPC from GIM at large. And so you can see the spec at the bottom down there. Goes down to the GIM, yeah, yeah, flink. Right. So, um, as an enterprise user, we may sometimes have default or elements which are related to mainnet being enabled by default or available to you, which might not make that much sense for you in the enterprise. Yes. What part is the problem to kind of Verify on is when the transaction is is stuck. Yeah. Um, well, is any of these interfaces useful to detect that that is the situation? Yes, you can talk about it. Thank you. See, so well, can you repeat the question? So yeah, of course. Sure. One of the hardest issues, uh, Jim and I think one of the hardest issues we've had is a transaction is stuck in the pool. Uh, 
we talked about that yesterday. Um, you have a announce, right? So one of the convections got knocked out, and now we have collections with a higher announce, and that convection, they're all stuck in a pool. We have you know, one pool in sequence. Um, so now what we need to do, we need to gain everything from the pool if we could. We set two good states and we go back, right? That's why my brother is which I like is to pull the plug and get the new build going, right? That's that's how to do it. Um TX4 allows you to see what's in your convention. You can get too busy on mainnet. So on mainnet you may have that other information. It will take down your node just printing out all that and just not the same don't do that. But if you're in enterprise, you should actually get some meaningful stats on the solution pool, and you can yank things from the text pool to the same question. So remember it correctly. Okay. And by the way, if you want to actually do collections at a high rate, there's a product out there called Firefly. That will do that for you. I'll do that. You can choose that, retry that. Which is very useful and kind of speaks also to the middleware that you may need if you're operating at scale. You can't just rely on a collection pool that bundles into place with you. You do superhuman stuff and then you your your system, reorder them in a nice way. Uh, some of those collections will not uh, go through each other. So having a very nice subtle algorithm that can do that is very useful. And that's what that product does. So, Talk to the guy over there. You know. Okay, you will not know this because it's hidden. We don't talk about this, but we can create hidden facts. Now, that's the dirty stuff. If you want to get the actual value of all the things and all the, well, now you can configure it. This is very useful when you make something available, what was finished, what was shy, we don't know if we're going to have trouble and we should mark. CLI arguments are stable, we can't take them away anymore, right? So by default, when we introduce something, the first thing we'll do is, as much as possible, make them hidden. So if you want to find you and go deep, this by default is what you need to be able to tap into. Um, so to actually see them, you do, instead of help, that flash, just called X help, gets you all the hidden facts available to you, and these are, as you can see, unstable options here, uh, so, for example, you can configure how many headers you would like to get from the chain when you ask for headers. By default, we ask uh, 192. Meaning, I come to you as a peer and say, I don't know where I am on the chain. I think I'm at block 312. I'd like to get 192 mixed headers. But maybe you're in the enterprise. Maybe you want to get faster. Maybe you know you have uh, fiber optics between the machines, right? Maybe you get, you can ask for 10,000 of them. That might help. Or they might just congest your network, which is why keep them in because we don't know what good value is. But we'd like people to try it and tell us what's what's sitting there. Hopefully you find it as exciting as I think. Okay, so how will you run this? Sounds maybe obvious, but let's go. You can go and get releases from GitHub. You download the release, unpack it on your machine, so what, right? You can also install it with Homebrew. You can have Mac, Pro install Bezu, do the job. I don't think this is going to work for anybody here. It's a pleasant day, thank you. Maybe the streets of Homebrew will get on today. And finally, of course, we push everything to Docker and Docker Hub, so you can just pull from it. Now, maybe if you're in an enterprise of some character, you might be tempted to have your whole distribution. Absolutely, of course, you should, right? Uh, this way you can verify the binaries, but that's your whole security, all that stuff. But if you're just starting it now today, you can do this. Next step is you have the source, you can also just do Gradle W assemble, which is the default task in Gradle, which is a build tool used by Desu, that will just run through and pop out all the Jedi code and create the target scene that's in file for uh, everything that goes in, in this. All just work. Okay. And 
branding test. You wish to do that. It's quite um, By default, you know, we run with native libraries. We're trying to work. I think ARM support is not banded so simply, uh, but we have native uh, libraries in a separate repository that we maintain as well. Only decap will kind of talk about that because it's a lot of fun. Okay, so we get to the simple options. Let's go to the advanced options. Anyone here use those? You must have used those. Yes, it's two. Okay, so um, remember network equals dev? You can also just remove all the wheels on the bike and then go Genesis file and then point to a JSON file. JSON file is the definition of your network. It's allowing you to customize how you see body, how by what the editors can to use, um, how you to set the initial fonts, um, all this information is important. Um, for RPC, we're going to talk about additional considerations for security, such as having cores, for example. If you've done any front-end development, you must have heard of cores. It's big. Um, by default, you know, uh, this will only accept uh, requests coming to localhost. So if you were to enable this over a, this is the open internet, which is a bad idea, you would add it to the TNS name that people would use to connect to it. Um, and then you can this is specific to this. We can set additional configuration items to uh, have some authentication. Um, is there a JWT, which is a, a web token, so for the wolf and, and the like? Or you can have also, um, I think it's a basic path. So one, one I love is if you have metrics, you can enable metrics, which will open a Prometheus server by default. That will run on the initial uh, slash, slash metrics uh, path. Um, and you can see here, it can set its own port and host. So you may choose to enable that internally, or you can decide that all these interfaces need to be available on, on a secure interface, for example. And uh, recently, we had the ability to choose between Prometheus or Open Telemetry. If you were to use Open Telemetry, it allows you then to push all the data out to an Open Telemetry collector. Or an open telemetry backend in your lab. If you're a miner, you can decide that you want to enable mining uh, useful for work, especially on, on the dev network, for example. And you can also decide that you will un enable eight zero zero eight to put the connect to you and send uh, work to this room to submit. In that case, point base is necessary, the point base is the account that gets money every time you The uh, JWT public key file option, um, is there a way to configure it such that the JWT token comes from a centralized service that is yeah. by some other organization? So let me do that for everybody. So for the JWT, right now we take a file. Is there a way to make that more, I'm guessing, more dynamic to right? come on from a service? I don't think we've done that. I think that would be a very welcome, uh, you know, enhancement to this because, yeah, files don't, don't really scale well and we force to restart the client. And one last thing was restarting this one was it's funny because it's spreading some meaning, it's spinning some plates, right? So, no, I don't think it's what it's like. Yes. A few questions on that, Rex. Uh, so, my default is. Prometheus, which is set up, or uh, or you can just change that to uh, like Splunk. Uh, by default, none of those things are set up. So what's the default uh, macOS navigator for? Uh, is it? What's the default network selector? No, no, not network selector. The matrix navigator. Oh, uh, by default, no metrics are being connected. So you know, if you want to go parallel, full throttle, not connecting metrics because. You're confused, you think maybe it's going to take a 1% or a percent of your CPU. You decided that you're going to you know, burn this thing down. 
then total minimal metrics, right? It's used more, but it's not that much. So we actually Yes. One more question. Um, for authentication credentials file, I wonder if um, it's worth having an option, similar option, but instead of getting the credentials from the file, get them from a vault somewhere using a TLS connection. Yeah, so the, the, the question here is about having credential file, again, goes to a file and you should be using vault or service to run all that. Um, yes. Um, completely, I, we've had to do that with Kubernetes, for example, the collector, um, different project, but I agree with you, that's the next step, is that you want to have rotation of the token, right? For example, being taken care of, and like that. We don't, we don't have that. So I think that one. I don't think we watch the file. On that um, so this is worth uh, thinking into just a minute. Okay. So, um, for the exercise, it's your understanding what happens when you do dash 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 for simple step. Um, so you can run uh, this one, run it with the for simple step, and then you can enable RPC, try to play with it. Um, and the first thing we're going to do is actually look into the covers, right? So when you say big for simple step, what's really happening is that you're picking um, a Genesis file, which is uh, shipping with spacing, which is going to be under a source code on the dot Maybe take a look at that together. Antoine, while you're doing that, there's a question from chat. Is there, an, is there any option to get metrics like network latency or transaction latency? Yes, so we get a ton of metrics. Um, collection latency, yes. Network latency, no, um, because we need to talk to you about what network is now, but then we don't choose. A blockchain itself is a network of things, so what the latency is, how much time did it take you to get to head, for example, that is useful. That is um, something that I think we capture using the, with a specific metric that tells you which in the moment that head was generated to the moment you saw head, how long it took, which is extremely important in, let's say, uh, a proof of work network. So if it takes you 10 seconds to see all the other mistakes, then more problem. If it takes you five seconds to get to the latest block when it's being published, then you won't have any more time to validate that block before the network happened, and then you have even less time to propose changes. So this is a uh, if you're talking about network latency itself, which is the time it takes if you uh, just ping to nodes, um, I don't think they have that by default. So, um, as you can see, this very nice to here in the room. I'm going to try to zoom that up. So, how's that look? Okay, yeah. Thank you. So, when you look at the Genesis uh, file, this is not coming from this one. This is a standard for Ethereum, right? This was not invented by the developers. This came from Geth, this came from Vitalik, and everybody here worked on the chain. So, mainnet is, it looks a little like that too, right? If you know this, then you can go gamble on. Uh, so, um, your Genesis file at the top is going to define its configuration, which is the most important tidbit. Here it says chain ID is 1337, right? This chain ID is very important because when you connect to other peers, we're going to check where the size is in chain ID, or we will disconnect because we're about to get hacked. If we don't have the same chain ID, we cannot talk the same language. Every transaction is going to embed the chain ID in the signature to make sure that we don't have replay between chains as well. Okay, next we're going to decide where we are in terms of uh, EVM and behavior. So what we're saying here is that we will go with a hard fork called London, starting on block zero. That may sound weird. We can show you the example with mainnet. Mainnet said, you know, if it's called block zero, then they made some changes, about uh, three million they changed, then again and again and again. 
because if you start with fresh with a dev network, you can go with the latest hard fork. It's saying that it starts about zero. So if you were to create your own network in consortium, you will have to make that choice too. You will decide, okay, I'm running with this version of EDM, with its capabilities and functionalities, and you will be studying at this block. If you were to change later, your consortium would integrate that you're about to change hard fork over to a new version of the EVM or a new version of the of the EVM network specification. And you would change your genesis box to tell it, hey, uh, this new hard fork at block five million. Everybody's going to synchronize and change over to this new definition, which will change the rules by which we validate bots. So if you have one striker who does not have the right configuration file, your host. He cannot talk to you anymore. Don't look at your box and say, oh, I don't understand what you're saying. Your validation does not match what I have. Therefore, I will stop accepting blocks from you. That happens. Right? We've had those issues over and over every time. Every time we have a hard fork, we have about a third of the clients that would just disappear. Right? We were no longer able to keep up this head for a minute. And they eventually come back because people realize, oh, my class is behind. What's going on? I'm not getting new blocks. Well, to change and get a new version of death, which comes with a new definition, or you need to change your JSON file by hand to make it match. So if you're operating a network, this file is very important to you. Let's continue. You have your own enterprise. You like you like code, right? You need to have a contract size limit that may be custom. It may be longer. By default, on mainnet, they try to keep the contract small because they don't want to work well, right? They don't want to overwhelm the storage. Your enterprise, you're never going to get to the level of complexity you have to deal with, so might as well allow you to have longer contract on this. Um, this is specific to this uh, network. We're now talking about how it's going to do consensus. And we're picking the if hash proof of work consensus. But look, we've got a twist on it. We're saying that the fixed difficulty is 100. You need, frankly, it's pretty easy to post a bug, right? Usually the difficulty is, uh, yeah, it's usually much, 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 much higher. So now we go into the actual first bug. Yes, Chad. Two questions from Chad. First of all, what do you think about using Web3J to connect with Bezu? Sure. Sure. Second question, what is the highest transaction throughput registered with Bezu? Which consensus, which consensus algorithm was used? Some people have said that, well, can, can you repeat the questions? Of course. First question was, um, can you use Web3J with Bezu? What do I think about that? It's a great tool. It gets the job done. Please use it. Yesterday we had a great presentation by someone who showed us how to use Web3J for unit testing, which is really cool. You should use that. All tests are better. Uh, if anyone is not going to have a great test, please test your stuff. You know, you'll kind of have a much better time than I would. Um, so make sure you use that. Um, the second question was What is the highest transaction throughput registered with Bezu? Which consensus algorithm was used? So, what is the highest transaction throughput with Bezu? Which, which consensus was used? And I think we've seen practical term. Um, so first of all, like, uh, besides the experiences in Scrum, I've heard of people being able to get through this reboot with QDFC, um, something like uh, 1,200 transactions, but they were doing native, not the EDM. They were now doing, uh, they were just sending money to each other. Right? Um, and that was a very constrained environment. Uh, Vrility seems to be around 100 TPS from what I heard, right? Um, yeah. Um, so um, these these numbers, um, what we have right now, I'll, I'll say one thing. I think collection throughput is actually a bit of a misnomer, and we can find ways to uh, batch collections or play two collections to do a number of very interesting things that allow us to do it. The thing that I would look at in in for many, for example, this use case has been much more pervasive is. It's not so much sending data, how do I get data back in the blockchain? How do I batch my calls to 
you can roll the that back faster, that's even a bigger problem. But then, yeah, depends how you use the, the budget. Uh, you can also just use a budget to just store hashes. Do very little logic on it. Just use uh, offline logic to check your hashes against what you have. It's up to you to decide how much of the power of the blockchain you want to dig into it. Uh, and that changes quite a bit the equation of how much you care about the blockchain. Some of the important uh, EIPs are not listed, for example, EIP 155, but uh, yeah, EIP is turned on by default. Uh, EIP 155 is turned on by default based on Tension Whistle, which is a video all hard work now. Because in this particular case, we're using London. What we say, and I'll show you in the code, is that it will inherit every hard fork before it. So all the EIP 155, all the things from before were there at the for any, any hard fork. That's true, yes. The way the way they set up right now is community, meaning you inherit all the changes that were made before. Um, it kind of makes sense, right? It's really difficult to get some changes that happen much later without changes that were happening from EIP 155, for example. They're kind of really built on, on top of each other. They're all available at the same block uh, at the same time. Yes, yeah, so they will, the, the, the block here tells Basically, to change the whole validation engine it has to move to this new way of validating blocks, submitting collections, even just not this calls will change based on what the, the block is. Yes. We talk about matching cross sections. Uh, yes. You know, you're not graphing to like L2 here, right? Matching collections, we talk about, sorry. You're not graphing to L2 here, like there. Oh, no, 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 just very simple. If you were to make a call, um, there's there's a neat trick you can use, for example, is that you can create a contract that does things for you, right? So one thing you can do is you can have a contract with five things for you. And in that case, it's one collection, but the collection itself becomes numerous because you make it do multiple things, right? And so if you're looking at the collection throughput at a high level, and the collection is just, let's say, calling simple storage for setting get values. Sure, you're going to have a raw value of what collection is true, but the really what you're setting at that point is the whole stack of listen from EDM up to storage and all that. Another place you can play is you can <clears throat> create a number of contracts that call each other. And then you can do a number of things in those contracts that cascade to each other. That you don't have to do as many collections, but a single collection can change 12 things. So to you decide that. But your collection throughput becomes meaningless if you can approach it using this approach, because it's not number of collections uh, that will matter as much as the number of times you do S like uh, I was mentioned yesterday, right? So the number of time you go from this is is really what should be your your uh, idea of performance if possible. So I guess it comes down to the, uh, like the, the computation unit. Like how you yes, know, the computation, computation unit. Yeah. And the level of the EDM in its opcodes is what is going to define performance. And I find that TPS are um, meaningful, but they're not as um, deep as if you're able to understand the impact on this of what your transaction is. Yes. From the chat, could you explain the best way to manage a private base and network with a set of known participants changes constantly? Okay, so you have a, from the chat, you have a public consortium and you have members coming in and going. So now you have a big problem because it depends a little bit on how you set up users, how the participants participate in consensus. If you find yourself in a situation where you don't have voting nodes, you can participate in consensus. That's a big problem. We can't attack that. Your network's supposed to, you know, get lots every five seconds out. You cannot play with that. Because they're just RPC nodes, and they're just being allow listed inside your network. You need to find a source of truth that allows them to participate, and for every other node to know that they exist, as they can allow them to connect it here, which is not solved either. Right? So, for example, I think it was Adhera which used the uh, whisper based protocol to allow out of band messages being sent to all the peers in the network. They had about 300 peers at the time, all 
banking institutions. And if you need whisper to all of them know, hey, a new member joined the network, here is their identity. Let them in. If they were trying to connect to you, please let them in. Let them connect to you if they're good. Uh, I haven't seen any uh, standard based solution that does that very well. That. So, yeah, membership management, on the end, it's not sold. There are solutions out there. Some providers like Kaleido who have built uh, middleware to allow you to do that in some level of automated fashion. If you were to build this and you were to have a data reset process, you're going to have to think about that. And I think it's not sold, it's custom to depending on your use case. I guess I'll just add to that. Um... We just rely on the static accounts uh, to, to manage that because we have a way to distribute that to more nodes. And yeah. it gets picked up by the nodes right away. Okay. Um, of course, that's just on the provision P2P layer. You still have to manage the validators to make sure they're properly voted in the yeah. So, yeah, it gets pretty complex. So, and for everybody out there, so Clyde is using the static files, no, no static nodes file to represent the state of the membership. And you distribute that to all the nodes in the consortium and you update that file and it gets flashed. And then we pick up the changes transparently in based on GIF, I'm guessing it's not for go wrong. So it's able to pick up. Okay. Here's the answer. Just change the baseline. Yes? I don't get it. Good? Alright. So in the rest of this JSON file, can we talk about it? Right? You know, the full excitement of talking about very excited small values. I, I mean, I, I'm out. So, uh, this is your nonce, right? It's the nonce of the account that is part of this uh, initial block. Um, these are all the information that are typical in a block, right? So, gas limit of your block. If it's five data, it's a search to bytes, three, entering the kitchen, enter whatever you want. So some miners, for example, whenever they get a chance to mine a block, they put some extra data and say, mine by this pool, right? Kind of a vanity thing. If you're doing if you have the exact same thing where people like store emojis and nice things there, talk about them. If you're a bank, I think your extra data might be uh, useful to start information about when that was built or some information you may use. Timestamp. Timestamp of your block, number of seconds since network is nice. Don't really care for it that much. So this might be used um, some some math to decide whether you back from head or not, right? So it's useful as a kind of heuristic. Difficulty. Difficulty of your block. Based on forward. It's not used in most consensus algorithm, but you're gonna have it anyway because it's going to be hashed to the block header. The mix hash. Mix hash is used as part of proof of work. A mix hash is um, a subset of what is stored in the header except for the signature of the block. It allows you, using the nonce and uh, the signature, to verify that the block is valid very quickly if you're ready to do proof of work. As you can see, this mix hash is zeros. It's your JSS block, you don't care. People are going to have to trust it. Uh, if you're to do Anything on the enterprise, we say BFC to BFC, it's hash not used. Point is, who is getting the money for this block? Well, it's zeros, right? Um, so, you know, this is called a burn address, but it's all zeros, and you know, it should not be possible to have a key as a string of zeros according to the graphic curve, except sometimes that happens if you were to have some interesting mini tests. So, for now, money of these blocks is going to go to zero. Now, the interesting part is the unlock part on there. That's the initial fonts. If you were to miss that, what do you think would happen to your network when you're running? Nobody would have any money. The, no one can send any transactions or do anything on this network. Because you can't create if, if out of thin air. Right? So, this is the initial allocations of the private key, so here's the pop key is used as a key in JSON, right? Uh, actually, it's the address, so it's the hash of the pop key in the first 20 bytes, sorry. So it's usually the exact same one here. The private key here should never have that in the actual real JSON, right? It would never 
put your IP anywhere, right? But we're playing, so I'm gonna put that here. Um, as, you know, no comment here says don't use private key in a real Genesis uh, file. And then the balance, the balance here in the exact small format in ways, right? So then power painting, something like that, it's about eight decimals or something, and then it goes on, right? So we have a few accounts with money in them. If you were to run um, based on yourself, um, if they work both dev, enable RPC, HTTP enabled, then you would be able to connect to any one of those accounts, import them to a MetaMask, stop playing, send money to each other, and do contract deployment and other things. Make sense? Okay. Which is what we do here. So, if you were to run this, right, if you work on there, obviously it should be enabled, be enabled just on the host, just on the default methods, nothing fancy. Then you can do a curl request. A curl request came to a local host 8545, a localhost 7 JSON, okay, and it's going to call if underscore get balance, which is one of the if methods. And parameter, the first parameter is, I think the URL, the actual value on the latest block. So you can ask which block you want to ask for. That's important. And um, you need to give an ID to your just RPC, but you can set one. This way, you get a response, it will be set to one as well. Uh, and you get the version of the digital RPC, which is 2.0, which is very much easy. That is going to tell you how much money is on the account. Right? We wish to stop it. We've done this before. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great. Is this one starting for anyone? Does this make sense? Okay, so on a stick keeper, the notch. This is going to be a challenge. It's always a challenge. We're going to take a Genesis song, we're going to create one for an IDF network. Now we're going to do leaks. We're going to do something that people don't do often because once it's set, you don't have to do it again. It's positive. So um, we have a tutorial here on the box, which I mentioned are awesome. It's, it doesn't work for me, so I won't have to explain it as much. We need to talk about what goes into an IDF network definition. Okay. So, just to go over the dots themselves, look at what they make you do. We're going to have four nodes on our network, so we need to ask you to create folders at first. Those folders, dot one, data, not two data, not three data. All those folders are Why? It's because we're going to generate uh, keys to each of those, right? And we want to make sure we got them down ready before we start the network, because after it will be too late, we won't be able to secure those keys. But that means that when you start the uh, consulting, you may have at one point in time. All this information may be on one machine. If you were smarter than me, you would have done that on different uh, settings, groups, different permission settings, so that the only thing you get to see is the public key of each of those. So it makes fast space instances. But for these fast space exercise, you can do this on your app. So the next step is you need to generate a Genesis file, which is really just like what we just built. Said instead of if hash, now we're doing 952. Note the change. The change here is meaningful in the sense that uh, we're sending things which are specific to the DFT. <clears throat> in if hash, we, we need a fixed difficulty. Here, we're in control of how often we want to get the block out because we have voters that are going to be based on a number of seconds. So every two seconds, you're going to have a block. Um, 
default path is how many times you rotate with consensus, right? So you need to say every 30,000 seconds, we need to change the different participants. And then uh, we have request time of every four seconds. If something goes wrong, so be able to, to move on that. And then everything else is the same, right? We still want to use the fun days. Um, notice that we don't have extra data anymore, which is done. And at the bottom, we have this new JSON that says we need to generate a form. Now, if you generate that file, it's incomplete because it's missing extra data. But we're about to put it through the, um, the setup. It's going to take as input the incomplete JSON file. And it's going to generate all the properties we want. So this is going to generate the complete JSON file and also generate private key and public key of each of the participants for our consortium. Keys themselves are a folder, where here the name of the folder is the address. Okay, then we have private key and public key. Then we can then copy the key files in the right place, and then we can start dispatching that to different members of the consortium to tell them to go find that for this information. Okay. So we can run one, for example, we pass the right data path, we pick up the key file that we just generated. So uh, what's not explained here, that when we pass this ID key file to JSON, one thing that it does is that it will generate the extra data property displaying the form of that ID key. So in this moment, we generate four keys. Then it hashes them together into an RP format. The public, sorry, it takes the public key of each of those, puts them together in a list, encodes them in hexadecimal using RLP, which I'll have a sound get off of that, um, and puts them into the extra data of the initial block. Anyone using this Genesis configuration will be able to read that and tell, okay, if the next block comes from any one of those four keys, I know it's good. I know I can trust that. And that allows you to join, and then later on, you can have notification of those four blocks. Cool. Yeah. I got a question from Chad. What is the roadmap for Bayesian now? When, when could we expect to see those changes? Okay, so the roadmap for Bayesian, we're talking about this afternoon. I'm going to have a long, long session on that. We're going to talk about this. Um, the changes there, this is our stable documentation. We use that to get to today. It's used in production. Um, so if it works, I'm just trying to appeal to you to specific cultures of what happens when you start your consulting. I'm trying to also make sure I can go deep in the great stuff, but I'm trying to stay at a high level, you know, if you want to get into the weeds of what actually happens. Yes. You can also have like the validators like deploy separately and then do the so, extra data so you could also do that right, right? Yeah, if you were to do a really trusted set of ceremony, we would never have four hundred keys in one machine. That's bonkers, right? We're only doing this because we have right now uh, you know, this, this development scenario. We're trying to create a consortium in our machines. This tutorial ends with, hey, you're just going to run four times this on your machine. You can start smoking a little bit. Uh, yeah, that's, that's just for development. For natural production development, what happens is that each consulting member has been asked to generate on their own private key and only share the public key always. Right? The same thing that happens on Linux is true for enterprise. You never share your private key ever. Build the end. Uh, Antoine, two more questions from chat. Could you explain the differences between IBFT and QBFT? Which one is faster? Which one is more secure? Are both ready for production? And then there's another question after that one. Thank you. So, uh, IBFT versus QBFT, an interesting question. Um, 
so there's actually different flavors of IBFT. There's IBFT versus IBFT2. IBFT2 is closest to QBFT, but QBFT is different in the way that it uh, also deals with private transactions a little bit, if I remember correctly. The, the difference is minimal, but created all sorts of good conference papers in that. Actually, we'd like to talk about that. Yes. Would you know? Um, uh, one key difference is um, how uh, the box headers are validated, right? Uh, so uh, there is a key difference in there where for every round change that happens in QPFT, uh, there is a certificate that needs to be passed saying that, okay, why there is a wrong change. Thank you so much. Thank you. And the other Thank question you. is, what is the best practice in generating these nodes as part of the consortium and share the private keys with them? So, yeah. um, you know, not, was it says, not your money, not your keys? The other way around. Um, so you don't share your private keys ever. You only share your public keys. If you're to do this properly, you have a trusted setup where every new be generating those keys, store them on something that's a key ledger or something like that. The, the way you store them and the way you make them available to a node that has to be through you know, trusted ceremonies, right? You would not have uh, those flying around on Google Drive. And um, you probably share your public keys. Collection, for collection setup, you have to have pretty much a, a security expert in the room. But by you know the best way to solve that problem is your privacy principles. I don't think you can get that into the box. You should go to small testing. Thank you. Okay, now I've shown you all the steps. I've shown you the dev. I've shown you how to, by hand, create your own IBFT network. All this is <clears throat> super interesting, but maybe you'd like to come to the chase. You can do that today. You don't need to do much. You just need to type npx chrome dev quick start on your laptop. If you have no JS, we'll bring up this executable, go through npm, and we'll start asking you the right questions. It will ask you. What you want to create, how many nodes, the type of nodes, the public trust you like to bring on top, and it will generate on your machine right away, complete over compose. With all the options of all the nodes you want, it will generate the keys for you, it will generate the genesis file for you, everything comes out right away. So if you're a developer and try to you know, go through two hours of training, this is the one manner you can just use today. This is a consensus product. Works. Spunk is contributed a few things to it. So you have Spunk integration, for example, something like that. So we have plenty of questions so far. I do have a question that's maybe more relevant for Matt's session later about Bezu documentation yep. and staying up to date, so that might not be right. Is it the documentation staying up to date? Yeah. Um, so the way things are staying up to date is usually whenever you have a pull request that comes in that has an uh, impact on docs, it will be tagged as in docs or impact on docs, and then the docs team would know and to pick that up and start working on them. Um, I'm not sure that's still valid, and I'm not able to talk to that. Sure. Is this helpful so far? If you, do you feel like you understand this now? Maybe you should be elsewhere right now. So, we should be pretty great. We have three minutes ahead of schedule uh, according to the original 
However, we have about an hour and 20 minutes to go through part two. So if uh, you mercy, now I'll go to part two. Okay. Screener, welcome. This is a big You can get lots of prerequisites from there. If you'd like to follow along in the Java Git software, you can pull to ID, place the sources, and maybe from the Pixar, which I just showed you. So uh, let's talk about if not start sharing. So um, first off, why don't we use Base2 from being deployment to doing tasks and development? We have ways for you to kind of find your way around. Java has gone a long way. If you're a Java developer, you might know this. Then this is going to try things. So Base2 will try to kind of cut down a little bit on the toy. I mean, you know, also opinions about how you should format your code or what should be done about the right? Not sure. I'll, I'll get on that. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, people really want to see it. Um, yeah, the remote can't see it. You're good to go. Okay. So, um, there are two tools that I use. These are not special to this one. They're just like if you're just you might be using them already. One's called Spotless, and the other one is called Europro. Spotless gives you format your code for you, so you don't have to. Europro is going to apply a number of heuristics and checks. So that you can find all the obvious errors, such as not closing resources or uh, doing things certain way with streams, for example, that may have leakage. This is important because then we get down on our reviews or just doing a device based stuff. So, for any change you make, if you push, make sure you apply, process apply. It will save you a little bit of uh, frustration. If you want to go deeper, you can do a little bit of check, which will run error prone, also checks licenses and everything. So, here, like this, you put a demo down there. I will put it here. You can also do a spot that's check, it will just fail and say, fine, changes. So, you can see. Um, it's running Gradle. If Gradle has been installed, we'll actually install it for you. That's a warning speaker for this old version of the case. You don't have to write a version. As you can see, that's being spotted. Java. We also check for any Gradle files. Uh, and we can uh, say, okay, we're done. Build successful in 36 seconds. Uh, if you were to open a little girl, I'll try to make it bigger. So this is your well and So here we define number of cities, this is spotlights, men, on links that if you use spotlights, 
very simple, remembering and using ports, making sure we use the right Huja format, we use the version given here. We will import, uh, have some folders with imports. We move any white space in the new line. This is going to save you a bunch of by uh, we have. Okay, the first year to a project, if you don't have that, we just switch to switch projects. Which is easy, that's your thing. Okay, so see that away. Uh, let's talk about this with itself. So, this is a very old project. Let's talk about that. It's a multi modular project, uh, which is a type of very old product that has multiple source repository source directories inside the same key for um, All the versions of all the dependencies are centralized in one file, which makes it much easier for us to manage all the dependencies so that they are always using the same across the whole source code. And we have one place where all the dependencies are, the shape of dependencies, or Kubernetes, as I mentioned, but also to make sure the licenses are compatible with Apache. Right? We don't want to have a GPL dependency by mistake. So um, all of the dependencies are stored in one place. Okay. So if you were to assemble a zoo, let's just go and assemble it. So just like we did spot class, you go in there and do rebel W sample. And you can see it's combining combining all the projects one by one, going over them. Um, it's going to first start with the outline, those things that have the dependencies, then the libraries that have dependencies. Uh, it's going to bring them together. Then it's going to create a tar DC. See file. Any questions about that? I'm sure there are developers tonight. Okay. Yes. I've got two questions. Uh, from the chat, which is the recommended Java version to yes. build the project? I used Oracle Java 17 and 19 on a Mac M2, but had many tests fail when running guard loop build. You should be running with Java 17. Oracle is great. Uh, Chimera is fine. Um, we are actually using things like Royal VM as well. So, but 17 is the version to use. Right? Yeah, Open JDK 17. Sorry. Open JDK 17. Open JDK 17. Um, and the other question is but a new node, I'm sorry. Yeah. When a new node joins the consortium, how do other nodes identify that they are supported as part of that consortium? How does each node's mapping, how is each node's mapping updated? So when you have the new node joining the consortium, how does every other node know that this node is um, allowed to join the consortium? By default, they don't. And by default, they actually will say no. If possible, I think they have configuration to and also for permission, which nodes are allowed to peer with you, which is a good security setting. It's a little um, paranoid, but that's necessary. Um, so, as we mentioned earlier, uh, in some settings, what you will have to do is change the configuration file on the fly to change the number of settings nodes that you're allowed to peer with. Great. Okay. Yeah, so. Interesting. That happens because there's a little cache. So one way to do that is to do a clean assemble, which then removes any cache. The issue I'm having here is around some dependencies that I'm playing with in a branch. So having a clean assemble will then do the job. So if you think problems happen to you, it's stuck, or you have a weird issue, you can also always do parallel W clean, for example, which removes all 
all the compound code and all binary and all that, and then you can assemble again the bad caches. Okay. So, um, the repository is made of modules. Typically, the source code seems to be under source main Java. The test in the source test Java. Separately, integration test will be under source integration test Java. And so, this is SGMR, this is test. Acceptance test, which actually run Bezos a number of Bezos together in consensus situations to actually create situations where models connect each other, you can test all the permissions, all the settings there, and reference tests, which are taken after the chain. So the chain has a number of tests that get you through performance with each version of the hard forks on, on the chain. So, coming here, for the project. This crypto thing here, source name Java, then you have to do some of the test, which is a great thing there. If you're a good developer, you might be expecting things to be the same package, but it's not the case. All good. So it's time to look at um, We're going to see that some of the stuff is ready to be fair, but we have a number of middleware and high stuff, and it is going to be as well listed in this. So if I was to go through here, um, and you go up the top level, um, you can see that uh, we have this Ethereum folder, which itself has a number of sub-projects related to Ethereum. And then we have uh, a number of things which are just core. Uh, so for example, we have a whole module of self-configuration, how to read configuration. Like I mentioned before, this is going to uh, mixing together environment variables, uh, tunnel file, uh, uh, CLI arguments. So we need to have that you know, be almost a library of its own, as able to read all those uh, options. Um, we have the BISU uh, top level project, which is kind of tying together all the things uh, from those modules and putting the executable together. Uh, for example, uh, I think it's BISU has this main comment. So in Java, that's the first thing that executes when you run. This is the first runner that will start the execution of the whole thing. Um, what else do we have? We have things around crypto itself. So I think some of folks here might be familiar with this. There's all the things around crypto being moved over to its own project because they're just primitives around the signatures, encryption, things like that that will play out. Um, what else? But metrics. So, everything around metrics and uh, the telemetry of Prometheus, all that information is stored in all the sub projects. The EVM is now a top level uh, library because it's uh, becoming available as a module that is published independently of this. Uh, that was mentioned yesterday. Don't uh, 3J is using this module to. Uh, Inject Lithia into tests so you can help test. Right? So you can also do that on your own. You could use this library for all these cases you may have. You'll just need to configure the EVM for your use case. But that means too that you could have a very regular program out there in Java, and you just need to have the EVM for whatever reason. Maybe you have some legacy, maybe you have some smart contract. You don't need a whole bunch, you just want to execute some EVM code. Just before this, it's available to you. Use the right configuration parameters to start it, and then you can execute the EVM according to your own logic. So, for example, if you were to do a fabric method and you were to create a chain code that for some reason has to tap into ETM logic, you would be able in Java, in chain code, to go to an ETM logic and take a smart contract. As long as you're able to pass out all the information about what accounts are available, what the balances are. We have anything stored in them, you will be able to create kind of a mini environment for yourself as a joint developer. Okay. okay. So, uh, an example of an actual use of that is the, the person who made that contribution who moved that out, Stan Ferret, who is another creator of this, who did that for Hedera. Hedera had a need for an EVM, 
this in Java. Is that it used this particular approach? And now it's published as part of the class. So, the main common ground is this one. If you're a Java developer, you prefer a string. And if you like to use string, annotations, also some modularity like that, allows you to swap components. Right? If you're not a developer, you uh, need like Most development out there these days is done using bricks that connect to each other over interfaces and a number of uh, dependency injection, right? That uh, then uh, kind of decorate a little bit of good days. But the common brand is basically is that we didn't think about it. We started, we didn't know any better, and we created a bunch of things that have no dependency injection. So I'm going about to show you what happens if you don't do that in advance, and what happens if you have to pass a bunch of objects around to different constructors. It's good and bad. Uh, what's really good about it is that the ID really follows the path of all the models. I think they this afternoon we'll talk about quantization of things. That might be a good way to think about that. So if you have questions also about the roadmap on that, that will come up and we'll be able to talk about that in the future. So um, what also is used here is the building pattern. So rather than creating an object like a foundation pool, we have a foundation pool builder that will take the number of arguments that are extremely tight. Well, if you do that. It's actually pretty easy to read the API. And then at the end of the time, so this foundation pool builder is going to create a collection. So let me I'll put you through a couple of those. The basic controller is basic control builder. Okay. So the basic controller is it's it's super like it's awesome. This controller is this controller. Um, is the thing that controls the whole execution of the client. So it's the top level object. Everything that happens is at this. It has the current level schedule, the context in which it executes, the thing related to Ethereum itself, so if you talk to the network, um, your Genesis config options, so if you come in from the Genesis file or of a relay that come on that argument. Um, your node key, the synchronizer, which is responsible for keeping you up to date. This means you have like, all the batch back in protocol thinking to keep you on top of the box. Um, anything around just not just method on that. So how do you initiate that? It's simple. Just pass all those things in, right? Okay. That's the last one. If you're changing any of that, that's pretty bad. Um, then uh, you can get all of those. So, um, the builder itself is much more nice. And it's better to look at it from an outline perspective. The builder is encapsulating the basic controller, so you never really have to deal with it. And what it does is it allows you to create the controller from the you know, simple configuration, um, <clears throat> it's just config file, thing like that. So, basic controller actual uh, constructor is uh, not available to the public. Right? It's not really part of the API. Build by itself is part of the API. So we use that pattern to kind of make it easier on people when the user starts. So we don't have to pass all the domain objects one by one. Instead, we have helper methods. Think of them as some static or builder uh, approaches to the help you build things. Any questions about that? That was too much. Around is that you have a domain object with a fork ID manager. A fork ID manager 
is used um, and initiated from your Genesis config file. When you start to read this, you know which relic you need to change between different hard forms. This is very, very important. You need to have that available to components throughout. It's very good. This type of concerns apply across everything. So, let me show you. This fork ID manager has a hash of Genesis, the fork ID for block numbers, and it's able to do things like uh, you know, get the fork ID for chain head, create fork ID, get all the forks, um, check this peer to see if it has the exact same set of fork IDs based on what they tell you, and um, yeah, it should be able to, to, be, to be used to do that. So where is it used? It's used both in network and in the EPM itself. It's going to be used in your e protocol manager. It's going to be used in your discovery layer. Right? And um, so it's used in both uh, sets. Uh, the e protocol manager is going to rely on it. To check that um, if the, the peer communion, peer connection has great capability, if the version is over 64, check that the 4K is the same. We have the right Genesis file on both nodes. Right? So this 4K manager, where is it built? If I was to look for this NGN, go for Okay. Use test. Test, test, test. It's used here, transparently in the e protocol manager. So this, this is generated along the way as we create those, those domain objects. Okay. Blockchain, no forks. This is a default behavior from legacy. Or it's supposed to be testing one that has all the information you need to set that up. So this, this object here is going to be around different elements of your stack. Right? It's shared between your discovery and your P2P layer. That's just one example of what it has in terms of shared concern that we have to build with. Okay. So um, you know, clear consensus setup. So when you have these hard forks and talking about fork ID managers, you know, transition to that, you'll see that uh, hard forks change the EVM, they change how you sign transactions, they change how you reward people for fighting their luck. It used to be that you could bestow quite a bit of money on people and they would fight the luck and then you got greedy at that. They were certainly right and eventually just not making that much money, just making like a fee for people using uh, the chain. Um, block making changes, so we change that. Uh, collection of full fees, speculations, and more. So I'm going to use protocol schedule to show you a little bit of that. So, so the protocol schedule is going to apply a protocol spec according to a block number. Right? The protocol spec itself is going to have all sorts of interesting methods around what block importer we're going to use, what head of functions we're going to apply, what validator we're going to use. And those validators are going to change over time. So we have a way to build those and to go back to what Jim was asking earlier. And to see how they build on top of each other. So we have protocol spec builder. That is going to be the builder for all those specs. And it's going to take all those different uh, approaches. For example, the block reward plane, if you find usage for this, 
we need to see that, uh, for example, for the Q particle schedule, the buffer was zero. And we have all this set up by the place. So we don't uh, predict how much of the elements are mapping. So your respect, you should be based on the EPM version. You should validate according to what maintenance says. You should do things to be more blocks according to what maintenance says to do. You need to click the difficulty for you to click. You should be to just set everything to zero. You should be just applies the authority based on who is uh, is a validator. And then you need to, to use uh, clean block header functions to run through the, the header and check the header as well. Equal post schedules as that as well. So if you were to look at uh, what NDFT is doing, the bias changes here. So whatever methods you're using will change how you need to validate the header based on, on what is being used. So which order is not spacing. Otherwise, you will get to the block. Um, which uh, protocol spec are we using? Are we using both protocols or not? So that will change a little bit the way that it did about the how we linked a bit connections as well. Um, and uh, so again, build a method, build a pattern, right? We are creating these other poles and elements together. This is a bit of a is it? You can't click. Okay, so. Readable on the stream. I can't read that. It's readable on. Um, there we go. Sorry. This should be better. It's, it's painful for me to then I have to get even out of plantation mode, but I'll take that. So we're about to create a way to identify how we're going to run with IDFT, meaning that we're going to specialize how Ethereum is going to behave according to IDFT protocol, right? So we're changing things. First off, uh, the header validator is going to use the IDFT block header validator using information about second DFT blocks, um, also information in Genesis block on that. So we're going to use um, this validator um, going to check that the peer presented the block, the minter, is allowed to present that according to the current network. Um, we're going to, um, for the members, and also, since the members are the uncles, the additional blocks that were not selected to be in. Okay. Um, we're going to use IDFT logic as well, which probably doesn't ask that there's no such thing as owners in the first place. Uh, we'll use, we'll keep using mainnet, but body validation. So we'll keep using the, the Ethereum public Ethereum by default, right? So what I'm making though is these things can be modified you know, for your use case in the enterprise. You could change some of those things according to some specific use case you have. So for example, if you were to have a different consensus version, you would, you would change that. You would be able to also do path rewards if you wanted to, right? By default, we set them to zero because for there is no reason to pay people or any of that, but you could uh, meet money to create some level of inflation in your network. For example, are you running people? Right. And both those toggles are available to you when you create your protocol. And um, they are all important for uh, all the things that you do with, uh, with your own consensus algorithm. What's interesting is that it permeates everything you do, all across from collection, signing, validation. Uh, building blocks, all those things come together. So those are logic are really fun. So um can talk about EVMs a little more. Can talk about many EVMs, so so we're going to look a little bit at the EVM. I haven't talked about the EVM today yet. Who knows about the EVM load? Who knows about outputs? Good. All right. So, uh, I'm, covering, I'm, I'm going to cover the EVM uh, in 15 minutes. I'm going to do about 12 minutes. 
Like makes sense to that as well. So he can always be okay. Um, if you have a question about that, I'm happy to answer. So the medium itself is a series of bytes, right? That's how the medium instruction comes here. Um, each byte may have a full of output. And it force jazz the sequence of bytes uh, may be either uploads or inputs. So if I go to So here we have the first version of the PDM, which is a frontier EDM, is a gas calculator, this testing, which is Defines how we need to compute and how we need to take quality operation of the EDM. The gas calculator can also set everything to zero, so there's no gas, for example. Then um, it gives defined operations, how we need to pay for them, and the version of them. Okay. The frontier operations themselves are here, registering them, and here's the R. So if you were to define today a language from nothing, let's say you were. Did the language already, right? With a bit of time, you like to create those sort of things for you to do math on some blockchain. Then you start from first principle. All things you start with doing is all the math operations you can think of, right? Adding, subtractions, multiplication, exponential. Uh, uh, yeah, so module, module operations, uh, larger than, less than, all those operations are available to you. They become really small bricks, small uh, computation units of your smart contracts. Each guy can present the one operation. Does that make sense? So, we can see it keeps going, right? And those operations become more and more interesting. And some of them uh, are actually able to interface with outside of the medium to load information from, say, your storage or um, from your environment. So in the EDM, you can say, based on my block number, this, with the EDM, you can say, if the current uh, executor of the smart contract has this information, like money, uh, a particular account store that has some value, then do this. Those information are all available to you, but they're available to you at the level of um, the, the smallest function size possible. For example, instead of having a big diff about do you have this token, we're going to say, can you load please the storage account for this particular user on this particular slot and look at the balance of that particular uh, value, right? And um, the EDM itself has a number of things that you do because you're, you know, pretty much equivalent to the pocket calculator, you need to want to play things uh, memory so you can get back to it. So it has the notion of a memory where it can store intermediate results so you can go back to computing more things and then pull things out of memory again to finish your computation, right? So you pay for all of that. Every time you do anything, you have a gas cost associated with it. And of course, you may have variable data attacks and things like that. What happens is that you may try to use some of the EDM to take longer than it should. Right, so you can store our lights inside the memory, for example, right, to see if the EDM is going to work. What happens is we do a bit of test calculation, we notice you don't have enough money in your account to pay for this, and we bail. Right. When we bail, we say the whole transaction is invalid, we're not even trying to put it into a block, and we will reject everything that you sent us. Okay, so here's our developer. Would you like to know? We add numbers in the media. What should we do? So, when do we add numbers? Well, the <laughs> code add is 0, 0, 001. Right? So, easy. Claim is add, consume two items in stack, and produce one item on the stack. We have a stack, right? Just like your pocket calculator, that's going to have a stack of all the elements you're going with. So, even if they have two B integers, you write in the stack, 
into a sign number uh, positive. We will be to add them together. We need to return them to binary. Then we need to push it in the stack. So if the length of the result of the calculation is over 32, you just overflow. Right? So in that is um, we will send you the offset of that. Right? We'll, we remove the bytes that are over 32. Otherwise, just wrap the results uh, from those bytes into an item that you push on the stack. Okay? Now, how do you push stuff on the stack? So, uh, you would be able to push based on what is being sent to you. So, think of this as a you know, Google Telegraph. You just have like one rhythm, a series of things going, right? So, you read the byte, and then you read what's after the byte, and read what's after the byte. So, the push that operation says, don't consume anything because it's one thing. Based on the length of the push operation, read the number of bytes I'm telling you to read from the rest of the EVM code coming in. Push them on the stack. So often a program from the EDM starts with push the next three bytes, push the next four bytes, push the next five bytes. Oh, okay, we're going off on the stack. How far this operation against this make sure that it makes sense? So one of the things you can, you can push, for example, is the address of a person, right? That would be how you would possibly push a, a parameter to execute inside. So if you're a developer, you would be able to create neural code. If you're in the enterprise, for any reason, you decide that you want to have some meaningful change to the EVM, you can do that. However, what that means is that you want to go off spec with what the Fabian does, right? Then you have this uh, additional upcode that you know, can look at. Makes no sense. So maybe that's actually great. You know, no longer code can make you to it. So Safe, right? No way. Uh, so we've seen we've seen people back in 2018 that made changes to TVM so they would add their own upgrades, for example. Uh, if you ask the developers who you know project for tomorrow, they can read EVM code and it's painful to watch. Uh manage to do that all times, it's fun. Um, so you end up having like you know which light is quite hot and then you can read through this. It will be useful for you. You need to have a little bit of uh, knowledge about that. So there's some utilities out there, like there's an EVM executable from there that you can run. And you can give it the uh, whole execution of your code, and it will tell you exactly what operations are being run one by one and what the stack and memories are for each of those steps. Very useful if you're depending on something that makes no sense. Please so don't get there. As a Java developer, you also decide that you just want to have a breakpoint so you also Java code. You execute a mini test using the web switching, and right away you can see what the situation is. And maybe something is missing in the stack, maybe your memory is not set up. You'll be able to actually infer that by looking at the situation. So, so going back to the main HDMs. So what's kind of cool about those is that you have all the flavors of all the gifts, it's the start of the film, building on each other, and uh, you can see what changed at the time. What had to change? So the first one is from here. It's cute. Works to show you all the operations in front here. There's quite a few. And there's Homestead. Homestead, same setup. Homestead operations have registers. It just adds one more delegate. It's kind of cool because now in Java, you can actually see what's going on 
This is one hot coding. This is composable. And you may be, as a Java developer, in a situation where you may be able to change things however you want. The underlying assumption here, though, is that all participants in a given blockchain need to have the same set of opcodes, though, right? Like, you can't have different participants with different opcodes. Yeah, so it's really different. The underlying assumption is that all participants have the same set of, the same opcodes, the same validation. Yes. What, what what steps are taken to on the chain to ensure that that's actually true? So, like, if I try to, if I have a, a, a chain that has a certain set of, of opcodes, whatever, you can see my theory, I'm like, I'm right? Mm -hmm. um, if I try to join <coughs> that chain with, with an EVM that has some other set of opcodes, is there any kind of validation that, well, that I have the correct set? That I might Yes and no. So the, the way we do it right now is that we have four KDs which are going to be stored in your Genesis file that activate a certain number. And you could say that looking at the four KDs during the exchange of status, we check that you behave the same way. Um, but we've had a bug, like even the mainnet between parity and GEF. Back in 2018, we implemented a refund operation in the EVM. And uh, the parity folks we're using Rust. Rust is pretty strong about signed versus unsigned behaviors. If it is an unsigned as refunds, for the first time ever, there's some subtle changes to refunds to be negative. Maybe the process is back. All the priority nodes started going their own way. And only accepting blocks that were being mined by priority nodes, all the GIF nodes were going their own way, only accepting blocks mined by GIF. So it's really difficult when you have multiple clients and to agree. Even if you have the same client, if you have different versions, you may be in first surprise. So you, know, you have to maintain the Genesis file, make sure it's up to date, and the comforts are listed properly. And also, we have to have the same version of things. Otherwise, there may be some breakage. Sometimes it's layers, just passes. We can't, can't have half compatibility. Yep. Wouldn't you also have that uh, it changes like your uh, um, smart contract compiler like Solidity or something to take advantage of the new opcodes or the behavior? Yes. Yeah, so the, the, the version of Solidity will define how you compile down to code. Right? So Solidity itself is like this pseudo JavaScript. Right? Um, maybe you may look at Solidity and you see that you can do assembly level stuff sometimes. And when you do assembly level, it's kind of cool because you actually go back to upcodes and you do some least version of those upcodes where it's like push, push, bar, add, and like that. And it's useful because you're trying to reduce the amount of code you need to generate by not being uh, you know, handsy with it and telling exactly what upcodes you want to see. But it's also dangerous because sometimes you, you may not be part of it seems that otherwise it's easy to go generate. So, what Solidity does, you just like TypeScript to JavaScript, it's going to take your JavaScript bytecode and output bytes that represent the information. With new opcodes, um, a new version of Solidity, we will be able to generate better, more performant opcodes using the new opcodes that you give. So the, so the version of Solidity must be in tune with the hard fork you're using so that you don't file for an opcode that does not exist in your version. So, just work your head with the EVM. So, the GG Blaze Visual Machine is in stack memory, um, or in frames. What's kind of cool about the EVM is it works in different calls to each other, right? You've probably done that if you've done the solidity at some point, you're like, oh, I'm just going to call this other contract to this future. Right? Well, what's really happening behind the scenes is that your call is not putting another call, right? You may have some level of recursion, some level of calling each other very easily. Yeah, it's useful for a variety of things, right? 
um, share in uh, basically it would be manifesting in the form of a way to the message frame we call to each other. So we could create a lot of code. We can also talk about uh, having some uh, pre-compiled contracts, which are extremely useful sometimes. Let's say you have a HSM that's you know running in data center and back. You like to call that HSM. Every time you call that HSM, you pass in some arbitrary number of bytes and get a signature from The whole security department told you we will not let you deploy in pod if you're not using the HSM. Therefore, why don't you just build a pre-built uh, contract and store at a specific address and we'll call some Java code that may then connect to your infrastructure and perform signing in a way that is compliant to security. That's what we need to do. So, if you're to create a new code, uh, okay, we'll talk about that. I'll show you. So, I talked about the different RPC and all the families of methods, if, net, minor, CX pools, all those things. How about you create your own? Okay. You can do that. Here's a factory class. This is the good. So um, this is going to generate tests for based on the information that's been passing. These are all the domain objects that you can have. So then you can answer questions that are being passed into JSON RPC server. And here we are creating all the different families of JSON RPC methods. So admin, I mentioned that earlier. This is going to be all the methods for admin, Ziva, EDA, EDL, execution engine. If. So if is the kind of the full list of all, right? It's going to get you all the methods you like to call. It's kind of cool here. So let's say input number is going to pass, you think you give it the domain object that allows you to create a blockchain, but it's just a little simple object. So if we wanted to create no one word of this, uh, the input number itself is going to implement just an RPC method. And uh, it's going to be asked to respond. You know, this is uh, implementing the top base function. It's got a name, right? We call it response method. And what it does is it calls out the domain object and says, hey, what's my head dot number? Um, give me the value as a long, and now return this response to success. So, and create your own on this method. So, oh, it's super easy, right? You go in there, create your own screen. The question is, how do you inject that in the RPC server in a nice way? But uh, we can definitely do some things. Okay. Does that make sense? So, um, I'm the exercise that I've used, which is we're going to create a new opcode. We need to tie it up to our democracy server. This remote code is a shared secret. So bad idea to talk to someone about it, right? Um, it will allow us to validate that only clients with a shared secret can validate the bug that we care about. <clears throat> and we said by configuration of just RPC. So another code we have is um, very low variable not code for, for this. Just revise one more. So, um, so I have, I'm going to cheat a little bit here. I'm going to show you the result. So let's say we have a shared secret holder. I can mention this is a domain object, right? 
to manifest it into um, your your run builder. I just need to go down then um, and participate in the digital PC factory. So this you should see the folder, you should see the And when you pass in the eating configuration, we'll be able to pass it down as well. As well as that. Um, we can set its initial value based on what is meant passed in through our unstable EDM option, which are hidden flags, right? Uh, to set the initial value it starts. So um, the EDM partial configuration will have our initial shared secret. To pass that in, we'll pass it to our region here. We are creating our own uh, hard fork for Archer, which is going to have its load being passed in through uh, the JSON file. Able to have that initiative as a test. We create our own uh, RPC method with this name. We can search our secret. And now uh, we will create our own JSON RPC method just like I showed you. Uh, it will allow us to. So I have its method name. Uh, this means to get the new secret from the context of the request we need to share instead. Very simple, right? So I have a C button that's busy wire that I inject into everything at home. So you to be able to be set through a command line argument or it be through just an RPC method. And I, I'm able to set that up uh, inside my, uh, my environment. And I can change it uh, later with the uh, if and then uh, share the secret folder passed in, and then you can see here any dispensational object is not this method as part of this. Next. Just to make it behave here. So now we're passing our own overall spec builder where uh, we're going to have partial definition. And we're going to create our own version using our own mainnet for EDM or workshop. Share some folder, just see those more things. And then in the workshop operations, we define our additional operation. Our additional operation is our shared secret operation right here. And our shared secret operation in EVM is going to execute a fixed cost operation that says take this value, test that uh, it matches our shared secret. In that case, return one, or in the other case, return zero. So, what I'm doing here is allowing this to be changed. So I can pass in a singleton shared secret that I can set, which is an RPC or common line argument, and I can have that code that uh, will uh, behave differently based on what configuration I give it. So if you were to have um, an enterprise, for example, in which have a rotation, I think you also do that. It's a terrible idea. It's doable. Why is it terrible? It's for to replace the chain later. If the shared secret has changed, then you get a different result, which will invalidate all the blocks you have. So don't actually do that. But it shows you the extensibility of the approach that you can take. You can configure and set things over RPC or online argument, and you can change the EDM in a meaningful way to perform the machine model. So, 
Um, on my porch, and put more. Um, so, different, different ideas. Then, create a contract that will interface with it. Um, this is a bit of cutting code from another project I have that generates the bytecodes for us using our custom shared secrets. Do XF6 as a form of good. <coughs> and pretty much this, which we do in DT and generates the bytecode for you. If you can develop it, you can deploy the um, wrapper that's the argument to it. Sign that and send it to, to basically the blog. So, this is one way. It's actually taking basically to a different step where you're no longer in lockstep with my net, creating your own client, you're creating your own output, you're creating your own little cuisine things, right? It might not work if you're trying to be up to date, and the next time you create uh, this, you're going to have a hard time. So, this has actually built a number of plugins that allow you to send this meaningfully and also to make you a chance to show that as well. Unless we have questions about EDM or anything like that, I just showed you. So uh, business ways to, to do this plugins. There's a plugin API that allows you to do all sorts of interesting things, creating your own data. What it really allows you to do here in this uh, master uh, module is to define your own uh, additional elements uh, of, uh, of the domain. So um, all those classes as what is going to be exposed to plugins. So you can um, most of those um, have a fixed API that cannot be changed. Um, if you were to change any of the classes in here, if you look at the top of this plugin API, we have a hash that includes, and if that hash was to change, it's a really change of API. And that breaks all the right? So that's actually on purpose. It's uh, a good idea. If possible, we want to be uh, micro compatible. So I know that commuters will pay a lot of attention to this password check, and this point you can have stable. So that allows you to play these elements inside this, for example, uh, bug body, uh, hash, logs, uh, uh, collections, um, collection receipts, things like that, and um, allows you then to perform additional things. Uh, so you can swap in your own uh, service, um, can do your own plugin RPC request, right? So you can create additional elements uh, for you to, to build and extend this meaningfully at the at the edge. Um, another thing you can do here is that uh, in terms of plugins, we have a plugin for RTD. So RTD is a storage of choice for this one, right? Uh, it's stored on disk, it's uh, as you know the to see these projects, uh, we interface with the GNI, very low level, uh, there's a level of action. There's some good uh, discussions on the merits of it from a standpoint and how you can configure it uh, according to the GF theory. So, for example, are you going to compact every two megabytes or two megabytes? But in my case, uh, what I want you to do is to swap RCD for something else. Right? Um, so, as you can see, RCD itself is a plugin. And um, it will take some options, which is kind of cool. Because for case of this plugin, actually get it configuration. We can make it do things for you. Uh, and it's going to be registering itself as a way to do key value storage. Because that's what works in these at the end of the day. So, it bytes in as keys, bytes as a 
So um, I wanted to do is to try to use the project for, for starting all the sites. So it might not be um, eligible uh, to this plan, which is fine for this organization. What I want to show you is it's possible for you to extend the need to this with no need to need this file on stored data on this, which is good news. If you were to have an Oracle shell, for example, and if it has to be in an Oracle database, that tells you this would come on top of it. Confidence wise, I'm not sure you get better boost, but hey, you know, that's how it's that's the um, safety concept. So uh, this defines another plugin that we just have. Defines the two step plugin, it just shows the rocks to the plugin. Exact same structure, we need to create here we need to register it. The top, right? And we can start running. It's for testing, or we can run it as part of, of this command, which is registered as well. And uh, then we have dependencies. <coughs> so here we have the definition for build for the grow, how to build this. Here we have the actual key value storage. We can spend that would be dealing with key value yeah. pairs. And then you have the factor here, which allows you to build a key value storage. So just like you would with uh, RocksDB, this allows you to change the key value storage mechanism for uh, this. Right? So <clears throat> this uh, single cache manager defined by FinSpan gives you the ability to use cache. Uh, set some properties that are specific to each cache. Uh, configures the cache itself. In that case, for example, I say, hey, uh, store things inside the data folder, um, store expired uh, information, which is those two caches together inside the expired folder, buy some compression, buy some cache size, buy some block size. All those things are specific to each that initial stuff and install this. What's kind of cool is that it's by itself, this is a layer around uh, RocksDB. So it allows you to apply a level of caching and uh, in memory optimization. So instead of going to this all the time to ask for values, this thing is maximally uh, roundable to uh, buffer the load. The other thing it does is uh, by default, in async here, which is an option. Uh, it will have a thread if you write to this and you can copy the writes so you're not constantly looking for your life. So, uh, solution is probably true. All those things are just to comply with the key value storage factory and your plugin itself. So, it's probably the ones available by default for, for plugins. It registers a factory here. So you can have global configuration, create your factories, register key value factory, key value for privacy as well. So you can go. Bring some options. So you can pass in you know, all sorts of options about the you can actually size you like for rocks in the inside the uh, number of threads, background, all the things that you like to tune in when you're an operations person to really see if you can squeeze like five percent more out of your best suit so you can get over to PS, for example. All those become available to you. Um, and then the configuration itself is just the, the domain object of configuration right from CI and some tests. This is that to create plugins that allow this to, to behave completely differently. We're using it since that. We could be using Cassandra. We could be using a restaurant database. We could be using uh, fast hats, right? Yes. So there's a wealth of options here. This opens up also the discussion with Saturn, who's to run now, about how this can be made composable, extensible, has the ability to change itself to fine tune for high TPS, or maybe to you know, just play around and give you options you may not have otherwise. Uh,
that also allow you to, for example, change to a level DB? Yeah, you could change your level DB to sequence. Absolutely. Do you think that makes performance improvement no, for Rock DB or not really? No, I think uh, Rock DB has surpassed level DB and Kimono. <laughs> you try. It's, they use it in Teku for the consensus layer. It's The problem is it's like not as, it's not maintained, the database, level DB. So that's why we stuck with rocks. And the recent performance improvements are make a kind of negligible difference. Yeah, so you could you could do the same thing. Yeah, so you to for people outside, so they, they try level DB, it can really get them the boost and the latest performance uh, improvements for rocks to be make it much more worthwhile to the sequence. Yeah. Okay. Um I also would love feedback because there was pretty much out there went through everything back. Just a question. So what's the scope of the plugins that we can make? What's the scope of the plugins? It's actually uh, pretty restrictive. It has to be set as part of the API in Java, as you can see. Um, so you would need to do that. There's a way to load dynamic plugins of a folder so that you kind of can drop them in and they go to jar reading and try to, to load them in. Uh, but I'm not too familiar with that to try. Um, so I think you can do uh, storage, you can do things around metrics. There's some APIs that you can tap into. I think you can generate your own RPC methods using the plugins, uh, for example. So you have some some flexibility, some flexibility to implement some options there. This is clear. Has any work uh, been done towards uh, sort of formalizing? Any kind of collapsing of individual operation, so of, of, of multiple operations into into simpler, lower cost, from a gas perspective. So your question is: Is it work towards standardizing multiple operations into a group of operations to kind of cascade down the cost, the cost, or do it? I don't, I don't think that's been done at this level. Maybe the solidity folks would be happy to have a discussion because they are constantly tweaking how that generates your code. I'm just thinking about like in particular data loading, data data storage, yeah. uh, repeated loads, repeated stores might well when you load the first time it costs more, every subsequent load is, is cheaper. So there's warm and cold costs in the EBM. Uh, and they're constantly tweaking to Antoine's point, like what is considered warm, what is cold. Shanghai has some changes too to this. Again, I guess you're kind of bound by the protocol, right? So like you can't you can't have a different cost on base over. You could. It's just why bother to break compatibility. If you're running a private network that has a gas cost, you can delineate the gas and the cost that you want anyway. Like you can kind of charge those fees. I mean, I imagine there's ways you could write a smart contract to batch workflow logic within yeah. a single transaction. That's yep. gonna let you do that, but you the problem the data load is you're if you're batching a bunch of them, your your data set isn't going to be synchronized across transactions that think they've completed that didn't load. And afterwards you're in this weird space where it's like I don't even A. But A has yeah, A hasn't loaded yet. Yeah, so first thing is there's there ways to batch or to upgrade your Smart contract and then they will um, optimize your gas usage. <clears throat> it's called gas dolphin. Yep. There's some trigger spreads about that. Where people like you know try to up another about the best way to build things. It goes also to my discussion earlier. When you do a transaction, inside that transaction, the gas cost will change based on what is warm, what is cold. If you have ten transactions and they end up loading the same storage cost, <coughs> the same storage uh, slot over and over again. You're paying a bunch of gas for nothing. You much rather have one transaction that pulls out and does a number of things together as much as possible. So you can 
reduce the amount of work that you have to do. And that might change again in next work after this. Just transient data storage between calls. Wow, stay tuned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's been a it's been a journey. So the the whole discussion around gas costs extremely intricate and end up about you know going down to the economics by looking at the activity on mainnet, for example, and seeing what people are doing. Uh, we saw some, I know that there are some discussions at some point where folks realize that destroying their contract and rebuilding it, repeating it in one production will actually give, give them some gains. Um, and there's all sorts of uh, very unhealthy behaviors that are coming from this type of optimizations. We're not concerned by that, thankfully, hopefully, we're on private networks where that doesn't matter, right? Uh, but that is. To some extent, like some of the difficulties, some of the decisions that are being made, they will impact you all out from mainnet. And mainnet is constantly trying to meet those parameters. You should be aware that uh, there will continue to be improvements around those particular elements. It's just a fact of life. Yeah. One of the most annoying things you get from the to this. So if the goes away and one crystal shut down, you go back to the box. Is this best to have this same problem? So you're saying that one of the biggest annoyances we get for the question is that the storage itself is stored on part by on disk and may be corrupt if you were to no it's the no nodes we can ever see. Oh, it's it. You can yeah. you know, it's by choice. That's the question. Yeah. So if no nodes goes away, it has to leave your own SD. That's so true. Times three Y is the raw yeah. material of your process. Yeah, so yeah. It takes a long time to catch up. It's a storage cost. Yeah, yeah. So it's something that you see when you start getting like it builds this, this huge backlog cache. Yeah. Um, Do you know if SU made a no. different choice? I don't think Bezu made a choice that was that limiting in the sense that it does not stop you from execution on its rebuilding the cache. The cache is lazy instead. Does that make sense? But if the node is not constantly um, flushing to BoxDB, so oh, no, it's, it's flushing to BoxDB. Okay, so my bad. Yes, it's constantly writing all the changes to BoxDB. Well, condition. It's not. It's not keeping things in. Bonds. Uh, That's different on mainnet and in bonsai, though. Okay. But for your purposes, I'm guessing it's correct what you just mentioned. <coughs> bonsai mode is cool. If you're on mainnet, it's probably the best way to build on this. So all the time, you still just need to kind of to grow and keep growing, right? You have a key on your store, so keys. Present the current storage slots like that, but based on the activity, some of the skills are no longer used. Some of this data is not old, right? So, Banda is able to track what data slots can be free all the time and keep the storage environment of this almost just linear instead of exponential. So, another really good question since you mentioned Banda is it possible to run a Banda still turn on? Oh no, because so the archive node I mean, it is a process of keeping every one condition value of every state's value at the time. So that's actually a very big use case that I had to do with Splunk, right? So someone's going to come and say, uh, back two years ago, I'd like to know how much money I have. And I'd like to, so they would need to make a decision RPC call that says, you know, give me balance at about two million. If you have an archive node, then you get copy of all the values of that blockchain all the time across and you'll be able to answer that. But most chains will you know try to let go of this whole data because it's too expensive to copy. I mean you, you can do it. There's just it, the, yeah. you're taking a CPU hit versus a storage hit when you have an archive node that's using bonsai you'd have to recreate the state oh. all the way back. And there's like a 
maximum number of layers that we load that's you can parameterize yourself. And if you make it like, I don't know what would happen if you made it 16 million blocks to like go back to Genesis, but it would have to use the trilog and create the differential between the current world state and the previous world state, which is just at that point not useful. Um, okay. This is price. Yeah, it's like a, it's like really small. The numbers are good, but it's only good on paper because there's, to recreate the state would be so costly that you'd rather just run a forest. Yeah, yeah almost my assumption is that the documentation is pretty confusing. Uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, to be clear, the condition. So you're saying for everybody else. The condition of bonsai nodes and how bonsai works is confusing. But I would even complement that by saying that the computation of what an archive node is or a full node is confusing. And still to this day, if, if you're a different developer, just ask them what's an archive node. Has, you know, you have a half an hour in front of you. 